All right? Turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to be looking now at chapters 2 all the way through 8. We're going to be following and surveying most of the ministry of the prophet Elisha. Not Elijah. Elisha. Be the servant of Elijah. The apprentice, if you will, of Elijah that we were first introduced to in 1 Kings chapter 19. As Elisha was plowing with his oxen. And Elijah comes upon the field and he calls, much as Jesus would call his disciples. It's remarkable that he calls Elisha to leave his, his oxen behind. And so Eli- Elisha sacrifices the oxen. There was 12 of them. So he, 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 he sacrifices his oxen and then he follows Elijah. And here we are now, chapter 2 of 2 Kings. This is post-Elijah. In chapter 2, the first half of the chapter, we follow the the departure of Elijah, leaving this world in a supernatural way. You know the story well, that the chariots of heaven, the fiery chariots come, the angelic chariots come, and they they receive Elijah. And Elijah is taken to heaven, and he's no longer seen. We don't know how exactly that transpired, whether he was just instantly communicated into a heavenly form. We don't know. But Scripture tells us that he was raised out of sight just as our Lord Jesus Christ, again, would ascend into heaven and the clouds would block from any further view. So it was the case with Elisha. So we're going to be looking at these chapters in uh, uh, 2 Kings that's covering most of the ground of Elisha's life. So we're going to be going at pretty quick form, at a pretty quick pace. So I pray that you'll be able to stay with me by the grace of God. Uh, use this time to inform and to more importantly to transform us by his word. So I'm going to start here by asking the question of why God has captured such exciting pictures. I mean, we've already seen much in the book of 1 Kings, even up to chapter 2 of 2 Kings, many exciting and thrilling moments. These are the moments that are fit for the felt board in Sunday school. Remember the felt board? You remember that? I even remember the smell of that old musky thing. You know, the memory of the smell, it's one of the, it's those, those memories are the most ingrained, they say. The scientists will tell you that the olfactory gland and the smell, you can remember certain scenes of your life based on the smell. And the smell of the old felt board in that United Methodist Church in Springfield, in that musky old basement. Well, these are the stories that I loved as a child, that you loved as a child, likely if you were born in a church setting. The stories that were so exciting, like almost swashbuckling tales, right, of prophets, of Elijah, and fire coming from heaven, you know. These are the things that every boy wants to be able to do in the name of Jesus. Call fire from heaven and to see our enemies smitten before us, breaking their teeth. And these are the moments that it's important that we don't just get carried away. With the excitement like a nine-year-old in the basement of a, of a church with a felt story, reading and hearing of these incredible, incredible moments of power, the supernatural wonder. It's easy to get carried away, isn't it, in the excitement of the moment and the excitement of these stories. That we lose focus of why are they here. It's not just to be some sort of circus routine, right? It's not just Elisha's on the scene to wow and awe the people with his tricks, That's not the reason Elisha or Elijah or any prophet of God for that matter, or even our Lord Jesus Christ. Why were these signs, why were these miracles performed? What was the purpose behind them? It's important for us to ask that question. And I bring you to Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to start. For the writer of Hebrews says this, he says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So it's important for us to remember and to keep this in mind as we read of the life of Elisha through these passages, that the deeds of the prophets were in service of the words of the prophets. God spoke through the prophets and then God attested that those words were indeed true. They were to be proven true by the deeds of power and miracles. God's faithful words were attested to by the miracles performed. And so it is that God's proven words deserve devotion. That's the title of our message. Proven words deserve devotion. And here's a theme that's going to guide us through 
our text as we look together. Be devoted to God's faithful word and you will see his deliverance. Be devoted to God's faithful word and you will see his deliverance. And we're going to work our way through this chunk of scripture in in four points. The first point, we're just going to set up that God's word has proven faithful in the life of Elisha. We need to set that up because that's how the text reads. It, It sets Elisha up shows him to be the prophet to succeed Elijah, the great prophet Elijah, that Elisha would actually fill his shoes doubly. He has a double portion. So the first section, this first point, is to devote ourselves to understanding that God's word is proven faithful. Then we're going to look at three different portraits, three different people, and how they responded to God's words through the prophet Elisha. And those three responses really are ways in which we can each be tempted or, Lord willing, that we'll see in the first point, the first portrait, that we would give ourselves wholeheartedly to the words of God, to the words of Scripture, just as we'll see in our first point. So we're going to look at three different portraits and we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through this point. So let's look at the first point, this first portrait, which God's Word is proven faithful. That's not a portrait, I'm sorry. First, our first point is to establish God's word being faithful. So we'll look here at chapter 2. Look with me. The story begins in verse 12, verse 13, where we read of the, the of prophet Elisha taking hold of his clothes in verse 12, the second half of verse 12. And he tore them into pieces. We read of Elisha, in the moment of Elijah being taken into heaven, taken from his sight, taken from this world, Elisha in mourning, because the tearing of one's clothes represented great distress, sadness. One you could, a, you know, a moment in a funeral, you could imagine, in the ancient Near East, of, or, or someone hearing of terrible news of tragedy. The tearing of one's clothes, the rendering asunder of the clothing. And that's precisely what Elisha is doing here. He is tearing his clothing as a representative of his grief and sorrow. His master's gone. And it's it's an uncertain moment for Elisha. Think with me that Elisha has not yet been shown or told that he is to succeed, right? At least from the Lord, not a direct word. He's not sure. This is an uncertain moment. Is it that as Elijah is lifted from his sight, so God goes with him? Is it that for Elijah to leave his sight that the ministry of God's word and the the miracles and the power of the Holy Spirit go with Elijah, leaving Elisha back on earth with his 12 oxen dead many miles away and his livelihood gone? That's quite a moment for a man like Elisha. So here in this chapter, we are shown the resounding answer to Elisha's pressing question. And the question we see, look with me, verse 13. It says, And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, and here's the question, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And God's answer to that question, that pressing question, is immediate and it is decisive. For what does it say? What does it tell us? It says, and when he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other. And Elisha went over right there in the very same manner that Moses, in the very same manner that Elijah before him. Now Elisha crosses the Jordan River on dry ground. God answered the question with a resounding yes. Yes, I am with you, Elisha. Yes, I will move powerfully through you. And the double portion of the spirit that you asked for, I have given it to you, in other words. So Elisha succeeds Elijah. This is quite a moment. What a, I'm sure for Elisha, uh, a moment of great uh, rest, of, of rejoicing, a moment of, of peace, of calm. A moment where all those fears and uncertainties were in a moment, in, a, in a, the whisk of a cloak on the water. It was put to rest. Those doubts, those fears. And so it is. Elisha received his answer and now he 
is going to take Elijah's place. He is an authentic prophet. He is an authentic prophet, a man able to both bless and curse in the Lord's name. He has been called by God, and now he goes forth in the power of God. And now the following chapters provide us with many illustrations of Elisha's status as God's spokesman, as his prophet. Now, since, again, we don't have time to cover the whole text, I would urge you, I would urge you, spend some time this week as a family or as an individual, whatever, read through the, these texts, chapter 2 through 8, the life of Elisha. It is thrilling it is thrilling literature. It's beautiful. It is powerful. It's, it's exciting. And I, I, I have no doubt that it will bless you as you see God fulfilling his word through the prophet Elisha. So take some time. So we now see Elisha filling the shoes of Elijah. <clears throat> Since we will not, oh, I'm sorry, let's look at two villages now. Two villages that highlight the different responses to the prophet Elisha. First, we read in verses 19 through 22. Read with me, where it says this. Now the men of the city said to Elijah, Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. And he, then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. So first, there's this unnamed town that Elisha, this is the very first moment of his ministry. He steps into town. Coming across the Jordan River miraculously, God answering his question, am I to succeed Elijah? Are you with me, God? God says, yes. He goes to this unnamed town. They come right out. They receive him. Apparently, word had already gone out that here is the successor to Elijah's ministry. The men of the city approach Elisha. They tell him the situation. The water is bad. It is leading to death. It's leading to even miscarriages within their midst. It's a bad water source. And that's a bad situation in an ancient place. The water has gone bad. And so Elisha is received as God's prophet. They know that he can help them. They ask him, in, in other words, to help him. And, they t and he goes and he certainly does so. And we read the result is that the water from this day forward has been healed. God heard the words, the prayer of Elisha. God spoke through Elisha. And now the waters are healed healed. And the town rejoices, right? Now they have their water back. Now they have their livelihood. They can go drinking it without concern any longer. The water has been healed to this day according to the word that Elisha spoke. That's what it says in verse 22. So Elisha spoke, God proves his word. He attests to it. So God's word is proven true in these opening moments in Elisha's ministry. Second, let's look at another town. Read in verses 23 and 24. So he goes from this unnamed town to the very next town, Bethel. It's a well-known town, town, unfortunately, for bad reasons, because Bethel at this time in Israel's history has become the center of pagan worship. A lot of altars to Baal and Ashtaroth, etc., are located in and around Bethel. So it's a terrible, terrible history here in this town. So he, he goes to Bethel. Look with me at verses 23 and 24. It says, he went up from there, from this unnamed town, to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city, jeered at him, saying, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Why are you laughing? <laughs> that is offensive. I mean, what would keep me from, anyway. <clears throat> now I lost my place. Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Verse 24. And he turned around. Listen to this. Take note. And when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. Wow. What a moment. I mean, going from the moment in this unnamed town where there's rejoicing and the people receive him as God's, God's prophet and they receive his words as God's word, to now to being taunted 
and made fun of by a group of boys. Now, uh, just a couple things to note here. First one, it talks about small boys. And the ESV reads and, and translates the word small boys. I think it's more accurate to say youth. So we're not talking about little children necessarily. Not that there aren't an occasional child in that mix. It's a very big crowd. It's a crowd of delinquents, really. You think about some of the, you know, the, the kids that are out in the streets and, and they're delinquent. They're, they're wanting to cause trouble. And they are just, in one sense, the embodiment of Bethel. They have been raised well in the pagan ways of Bethel. They have been raised well to despise God's word. So what do they do when God's prophet comes? Get on out of here. That's what go on up means. Get out. Get out. Skadoosh. Get out of here. You're not welcome here. They say this to Elisha. And Elisha's response as they were threatening and jeering at him is to call curses. So as much as he has called blessings on the other unnamed town and healing their water and their faith, now he calls curses down on the heads of 42 boys, youth, who die being mauled by a she-bear. Two of them. Two she-bears rush out of the woods and maul 42 young men to death. It's the curse of God. It's God's wrath being poured out on those who disregard his word. For those who disregard God's word, the result will always be fatal, whether it's in this life or in the judgment to come. If we choose to disregard or diminish or make light of or to treat lightly as it has no consequence to me, if we treat it that way, there will always be a fatal response from God. There will always be judgment for that. For as we treat God's word, so we treat God himself. That's the connection we see here with these she-bears and this group of young boys, these young men, this youth. Is that God's word, as we treat God's word, so we treat God himself. As we treat the scripture, so we treat the living God. That is an important connection to make. It's a sobering connection to make. We cannot claim to love God and to ignore or despise his truth. You can't claim that. No can do. So as we treat the prophets of God, as we go about our ways, let us do so with a heart of a, a sober heart, a loving, a devoted heart, being devoted to God's word. So this unnamed town receives a blessing from the prophet because they respond with devotion to God's word, whereas Bethel receives curses from God, the death of 42 young men. These these events speak, and many others, as we'll see throughout these chapters, they speak to the fact that God acted through Elisha. God's words were proven true. They were proven powerful through the prophet Elisha. And we have to understand that it's of utmost importance that we also must be devoted to God's word. We also must be devoted to God's word. God's word must be taken seriously. It leads to blessings or to curses. And God's proven words deserve devotion. So again, be devoted to God's faithful word and you will see his deliverance. Moving on, we're now going to look at three portraits, three different situations, three different people And the way that they responded or aligned or oriented to Elijah or Elisha, to God's words through Elisha, it's very instructive. So let's look first at chapter 4. Chapter 4, we're introduced in verse 8. A portrait of a wealthy and a childless woman, a Shunammite, which means she was from a small small town, another small village called Shunam, which is located in northern Israel. This woman is remarkable, remarkable, for she has a portrait of devotion, pure devotion to God's word. Her life is contained here in chapter 4, and then further we see another picture of her life in chapter 8 of this section of scripture, where two times, under very distressing circumstances, she entrusted her soul and the souls of her family to God. She trusted God's word. She was devoted to God's word. And we're, we're introduced in chapter 4 and verse 10 that this woman had made a place for Elisha. Elisha was welcomed into her house many times. Hospitality was offered, and he received it gladly. And it became in such a way, in the relationship built over the years, that this woman and her husband built a a special booth 
for Elijah, Elisha in their home. So in verse 10, we read this. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, a lamp, so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. This reveals profound devotion, the hospitality that this woman and her husband put forth. As he, and the, the Lord rewards that devotion. Because we read that Elisha prophesies that this woman would bear a son. She was a childless wife. And he prophesies over her. God speaks through Elisha that she would have a son within a year. By the next time that Elisha visits, she will have a boy in her arms. And so it is done. The word of God is fulfilled. God always fulfills his word. It should be of no surprise that if Elijah speaks it, that it, would, it should be fulfilled, and certainly it is, does. So she bears a son, and that son grows up, just as Elisha said. And, but the story goes further because it takes a tragic turn. The son dies unexpectedly in her mother's arms. The mother then rushes with great grief, consternation. She rushes to Elisha. She entrusts herself and her son to Elisha's word. And the miraculous result in this chapter is something that we will see, you know, echoed in the pages of the Gospels. That Jesus Christ himself would raise the, widow, the, uh, the, the son of the official, or the daughter of the official, Jairus. Very similar. For here, the Shunammite son is brought back to life by the word of God through Elisha. And there's a moment that I'd like to draw your attention to in verse 30. Look with me at chapter 4, verse 30, because it's in the middle of this climatic, climactic scene in this, this terrible situation, this terrible crisis of the loss of a child, that Elisha cries out, I'm sorry, the Shunammite woman cries out to Elisha and says the following words in verse 30. She says, as the Lord lives... And as you yourself live, I will not leave you. Wow. I'm going to repeat that. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. What a, what a profound, profound profession. In fact, it's not the first time we encounter this profession. Do you know who else said this? Elisha said this. Chapter 2, we could turn back there, but in chapter 2, you will read that Elijah tried to shoo away, tried to push away Elisha three times, told Elisha to leave him so that he could depart and be with God, go to the Lord. And three times over, Elisha says these very words, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. Three times profound profession of devotion. This woman echoing the prophet Elisha. She, in a sense, clinging, like, almost like as though she's clinging to his ankles. I'm not going anywhere. There's nothing that could take, anything could take between, because I'm between us. Nothing. I will always, I will always be with you. I will cling to your word. She hangs on the words of of Elisha. Her hopes for deliverance are so clearly wrapped around Elisha, around his words, around his ministry. She has devoted herself to him and to the God who speaks through him. And the question is natural, where else could she go? Right? Where else could a woman in her situation go? Who else has words of life? Who else? Who else in Israel could have done what this prophet Elisha could have done? Could Baal, could other so-called gods produce such a powerful answer as to such a desperate situation? No. No. Can human words bring about the deliverance and the depth of comfort that our souls require in this life? Can distractions or substances, can relationships or accomplishments ever, any of those things, begin to touch on the depth of our need, the depth of our sorrows? as sinners and as sufferers. No. We need words from the true and the living God. We need him to speak and we need to trust in his word. Only his words will do. He has the words of eternal life. Jesus Christ. 
who is the word. So the question I have for you this morning, it's, it's are we devoted to God's words in the Bible? Are you devoted to scripture? Are you devoted? Are our hopes fixed on the eternal realities that the Bible holds before us, that the gospel proclaims to us? Are we devoted to scripture? This woman literally saying, I will never leave. I will never leave. I will always be with you. I will cling to you as the Lord lives and as you yourself live. I will never leave you. Would we say this to God and to his word? That's my question for you this morning. And it's a critical question as it reveals the substance of our faith and our devotion to God himself. As it's shown here in the in a ministry of Elisha, this is a matter of spiritual life and spiritual death. Therefore, we don't need generic over-the-counter kind of hopeful thinking. We don't need that, that leads only to further uncertainty and doubt. We need depth. We need truth. And this Shunammite woman, she cuts a path for us to follow, doesn't she? Of the kind of devotion that the Christian disciple ought to always have to the words of Scripture, to Christ himself. The, the level, the depth of our devotion. No, we need Jesus and we need his word. Take up your Bibles, brothers and sisters. Don't neglect his word. Hang on it as though your life depends on it because it does. It does depend on it. Your life, your soul depends on the truths and the words of Scripture. It does. Be assured. And so may your words echo the hopes and the lines that Scripture provides for us. This, this calling out of devotion to Christ. And really, Scripture is meant to be rehearsed in our minds. They're meant to be remembered. They're meant to be cherished. It's, it's like a bride longing for her wedding day. What will she do? She's going to think about it. She's going to play over the details of that event, of that glorious event that's coming. The bride can't stop thinking about it. Why? Because her livelihood, her joy is wrapped up in it. Well, that is no different than the Scriptures for the Christian. That we would hang our hopes, our joys, like a bride waiting for her wedding day. And if that's a foreign idea for you or a foreign experience for you, that the scriptures that you would be remembering and cherishing and longing for God's truth as a bride for her wedding day, if that's foreign to you, I would urge you to take a moment to call on the Lord, to repent, to ask for his help, to ask for his forgiveness. And that brings us to our second portrait, which is a conversion. A second portrait, which is a conversion to God's Word. And we read of this in chapter 5, where we're introduced to Naaman. So we've looked at a, a portrait of pure devotion. Now we're going to look at a, a portrait of, of a conversion. How a man who was once far off in darkness, far from God's Word, far from the promises given to God's people, brought near, converted. And we're introduced to Naaman, who's a Syrian army commander, who once, this man had leprosy, a debilitating skin disease. Well familiar with stories involving lepers. And Naaman owned a Hebrew slave girl who had compassion on him. And this Hebrew slave girl gave, gave other servants the idea to tell Naaman that there was a prophet in Israel who could heal him. And that's what happened. Naaman hears of this. And hearing about Elisha, he pursues a connection with him. And it's interesting. As he goes about pursuing that connection, he talks with the king. Since this great commander, this army commander is much loved by the king, much loved in his country because he's a great commander, one who conquered many foreign armies. Well, as Naaman reaches out to the king to set up some sort of communication and connection with Elisha, who's in Israel, it almost triggers an international event. A crisis. Because the king of Syria sends a letter along with Naaman. And Naaman goes into Israel. He visits with the king of Israel. <laughs> and he delivers this letter. And the, like, the king of Israel, naturally, you can imagine, he's getting a letter from a foreign king who hates his guts. The first and only thought is, is this some sort of treachery? What's going on here? What is going on? Are they trying to start a war? And that's what he did. And so in that moment, he rends his garment. The king of Israel in great distress, fearful, of clear, clearly fearful what could happen if the Syrian army would invade following Naaman. 
So Elisha hears of the king of Israel rendering his, rending his garments. And so he goes. And in, verse five, in chapter 5, verse 8, look with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him now come to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha tells the king, no, this, this is for a bigger purpose. This is for a much more noble, beautiful thing that God is doing in this man's heart. So this man may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let him now come to me. That's, that's the command Elisha gives the king. So this pagan army commander would indeed find out. But it wasn't until he was converted, until there was quite a story. And as the story goes, Naaman at first was arrogant and skeptical. He goes to, he goes to Elisha. He appeared at, Elijah, at Elisha's house. And Elisha gives him very clear commands. You need to go dip yourself seven times in the river Jordan. And as you do so, you will be clean. Well, to this Syrian army commander, whose heart is full of the Syrian national anthem, that's the last thing he's going to do, to dip himself in a foreign country's river. And he responds in such. He says in verse 12, Are not the Abana and the Farper, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? I mean, it really is the, the equivalent of a Ukrainian soldier being commanded to receive healing by washing in the Moskava River in Moscow. It's the same thing. So this Syrian army commander, very offended by the idea of washing in the Jordan River, almost, almost misses the blessing. But God turns his heart. Praise God. In verse 14, we read how, how the Lord rebuffed Naaman's foolish arrogance through the wise counsel of his servants. And we read of the result. In verse 14, it's how he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. The man was made clean. And Naaman's response following that in verse 15. Then he returned to the man of God. So he goes back to Elisha. He and all his company. And he came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. What a wonderful word. So this is a remarkable conversion that we're shown here in the life of a Syrian command, a commander. This man was far outside of Israel. Not just geographically, spiritually. Far removed from the promises of God to his people in the old covenant. He was not to be included in that covenant. He was unclean. He was a Gentile. He was a pagan commander. And he was a member of a country who's constantly at war with Israel. And the king of Syria, I'm sure, would be very happy to see Israel destroyed. But here's his commanding officer, his, his army, this, this man. And he is outside of the covenant, outside of the blessings of Israel, having nothing to do with the grace and the access to the truth of the God of Israel. Yet, this is the man, this army commander, Gentile pagan, is the one who says this in verse 15, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth except, right, but in Israel. What a profession. What a, I mean, his Syrian pride, is his ethnic priorities, his, his pagan religious commitments are all cast aside. They don't matter anymore. Yeah, throw me in the Jordan again. I don't care. Because now he knows, his heart knows, he is convinced to the core that there is no God. I love the finality of what he says. There is no God in all the earth but in Israel. He could not be clearer to how serious and beautiful this conversion has been. To know the salvation of God through Jesus Christ produces profound profession. Profound profession. That there is no Savior but Christ alone. There is no hope but in Jesus. Those are the kind of prof profound professions that every Christian heart must make and that we feel down to our bones. We feel it. There's only one Savior, and that is Christ the Lord. You feel it if you are a Christian. You know it to be true. 
And that has been your profession. And that is our profession as God's people. And it stirs up not only professions, but also affections. So we must understand and appreciate that we're not even slightly different than Naaman. You know, here we are on the other side of the world, even further away from Israel. Even further away and removed from the promises of God to the old covenant people of Israel. We couldn't be further. Couldn't be. Other side of the planet. So we are no different. We are not even slightly different than Naaman, my brothers and sisters. We too were alienated from the God of Israel. Separated from the covenants that were made to Abraham and all the patriarchs. And there's not a single reason why any one of us should ever have heard the name of Jesus. And that any one of us should have been converted and call on the name of the Lord. There's not a single reason why any of us deserves it more than the next guy. Just as it was for Naaman. Just so, so it is for what, with us. And the awe and the wonder of our salvation, we must feel it. We must know it. For that's what it produces in the true Christian heart. To know that we are profoundly saved by a great Savior. That we didn't deserve that. How? Who am I, O oh Lord? Who am I? Why am I saved? How did I come to know mercy from God? I am a sinner. And so are you. We were under the wrath of God. None of us deserved. Naaman was far outside and so are we. Gentile sinners are what we once were on the other side of the world. And yet Jesus would reveal to us again and again as the prophets do. Even in this instance with Naaman. God reveals here in chapter 5 that Naaman, a Gentile pagan, is being welcomed into the kingdom. Aren't you glad the Gentiles are being welcomed into the kingdom? Aren't you glad that the Lord has written down the names of people who shouldn't belong there? In the Lamb's book of life, that somehow, if you were a Christian, the mystery and the providence and the grace and the mercy of God, he chose you and he wrote your name. Why would he ever, why would he write your name what have you done? What do you do that deserves such grace? What have I done? Nothing. And yet this is, this is the grace we have received through Jesus Christ. And Jesus and the apostles, they continue this tradition of engaging the Gentiles and bringing them to the truth that there's only one God, the exclusive God. One God. Exclusive. And there's only one way to that God, and that is exclusive as well. That is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no way to God except through Christ the Son. That is the gospel. And if you are here this morning, and you do not yet know that, you must understand that. There's only one way to know the forgiveness and the mercy of God. That is through Jesus Christ the Son. You must believe in Christ. You must confess that you are a sinner. You must call out to him and receive mercy and forgiveness from his hand. You need it, my friend. You need him. And he stands willing to open our hearts. Church, what an unimaginable privilege of possessing God's word and the promises of God and the gospel. We must move on because we are de devoting ourselves to God's faithful word. And as we do so, we will see his deliverance. And this brings us to our third and our final portrait, which is a portrait of divided devotion. It's division in the heart here. And this third and final portrait involves the man named Gehazi. Right on the tail of that story involving Naaman, we, we learned that, that Naaman and his entourage are rejected. Not in a bad way, but Naaman asks to give a gift to Elisha. He says, Elisha, I have all these things. In fact, <laughs> that's quite a thing. Uh, it, it, it describes it as 10, th 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 changes of clothing. That's quite a gift. That is, that is wealth and riches that most of us would never understand. I mean, that's quite a thing. And Elisha refuses this gift in verse 16 of chapter 5. He says, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. So he shuts the door on, on Naaman. Says, no, I will not receive your gift. Well, Naaman goes away. He's grateful. He's overwhelmed and healed and converted to the words of God. He confesses the God of Israel. Gehazi, on the other hand, 
who's, who's Elisha's servant in the inner circle has a very different response. Just as the, the entourage is leaving, Naaman's heart falls headlong into covetousness. Headlong. He's swallowed whole by covetousness. And he, he, he hatches a plot. In verse 20, we read this. See, my master has spared this Naaman, the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I, will run after him and get something from him. So Elisha proclaims, as the Lord lives, I will receive none of this, right? None of these things that he brought. Gehazi, on the other hand, says, as the Lord lives, I will run after him. I will get something from him. It's as though this moment is when a covetous spirit took over and this man had taken offense that Elisha, it's almost like he's offended Elisha didn't take something from Naaman. Like, here, he offered it to you. Why didn't you take it? I could reap some of that. But he got angry. He gets, and that's how, that's how covetousness functions. We need to understand this. It's on the perception that wrongs have been done to me, that something's being withheld from me. And that's exactly how Gehazi is thinking. Something bad is happening to him, and it's at the hand of another person. It's Elisha. Elisha's refusing to take stuff. Well then, I'm going to have to do it on my own then. I'm going to have to take it in my own hands. So covetousness comes out of that kind of self-pitiful view, that perspective that I'm being wronged or something's being withheld from me, so I need to go get it. I'm going to go get that. And even if we don't act on it, it's in the heart. Covetousness is the desire, the lust, the desire for something that is not mine. Something I believe that should be mine because it's being withheld from me. And how dare they withhold it from me because it's basically mine right? That's how covetousness reasons within the soul. And there's an inherent accusation that God ultimately is not giving me all that I need, so I need to seek out my satisfaction. And that's exactly what Gehazi did. He was smitten by his own self-deceit. He is captured by his covetousness. He believed that worldly goods that Naaman offered were meant to be his, and that those goods would bring him the necessary security and the happiness that he needed. And so he goes, he hatches this plan. And as you can imagine, I mean, it's so dumb. Why would you try to hatch a plot against Elisha? Seriously. That's a really, these are, there's a couple dumb moves in Scripture. This is a really dumb one. <laughs> this is like up there. Like, I'm going to try to deceive Elisha, and he won't find out, right? So naturally, he goes, he carries out the deed. He, he deceives Naaman. He gets some things from Naaman to take to himself. And then he comes back, and Elisha, Elisha confronts him. Where have you been? And, and he goes in and tries to, he tries to tell a lie to Elisha. And he, he sees right through him. And it's right at that moment that a curse is pronounced. He pronounces it over Elisha, uh, over, over this man Gehazi and it says therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever so he went out from his presence a leper like snow it's God's curse comes upon Gehazi this is a man who's divided in devotion you can see it he's at war he's in, in the inner circle of, of Elisha he, he longs to be faithful right he wants to be useful and we see him in many times being useful Chapter 4, he's useful in, in seeking to bring about the logistics and things necessary to get healing to the Shunammite's son. And he's useful in that situation. He, I'm sure useful in many others that aren't even written in Scripture. But here is a divided heart because he was smitten by his own self-deceit. And he served Elisha quite well for a season, but it ended. And I, I think this is an important note to say to to young people, children, young people. Just because you go to church, just because you have a mom and a dad who love Jesus doesn't mean that you love Jesus. It doesn't mean that you are a Christian. Gehazi was up close and personal with Elisha. Where did Gehazi, what did he do? He went off the ranch. He left Jesus. Just because we're up close and personal to people who love Jesus doesn't make us love Jesus. It's got to be in your heart. So my call to you, young one, teenager, young adult, child, if you're here hearing my voice, listen, you need Jesus. 
Your mom and dad cannot bring you into heaven. You have to understand that. You cannot enter into the presence of God because you have a Christian mother or a Christian father. It won't work. You will stand before God and give a judgment for your own life. So my call to you, young person, is that you would receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would repent of your sin, that you would understand that you need Jesus. You say, I need him. I need Jesus. You would talk to mom and dad, even tonight. You say, Mom, Mom, I need Jesus. Help me find him. Help me understand how to believe. Help me understand what does it mean to repent of my sin, to be a Christian, because you cannot enter heaven for any other reason except through Jesus Christ. Okay? Worship team can return. As I close here. Gehazi was filled with covetousness. And in the, in the end, his heart couldn't be restrained. It was divided. And as our Savior tells us, this is the way it always pans out. He says, you cannot have two masters. Either you will serve the one or you'll hate the other. It's the equivalent of standing on a canoe and the, the dock at the same time. You can't do that. You can't stand on the boat and the dock at the same time. What happens? Splash. It doesn't go well. We cannot straddle the Lord Jesus Christ and this world. We cannot have both. We must choose this day whom we will serve. It's Christ or it's this world. It's what Gehazi was after in getting worldly goods and securities and pleasures. Or it's the Lord Jesus Christ being utterly convinced that Jesus is enough. And so I close with this passage from Corinthians and then 1 Timothy. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. As for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Let's pray. Our Lord, we ask that wherever there is division in our hearts, Jesus, would you bring healing by your word, that we would be convinced and that we would repent of any worldly pursuit, of any idolatry, of any covetousness, and cause us, Lord, to fall before Jesus Christ like that dear woman, that dear woman who fell at the feet of Elisha and said, as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will never leave you. And as that woman who fell at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet with her tears and devotion, Lord, that we as well, with affection and commitment, keep Christ at the very center of all that we are and all that we do. Lord, help us, guide us. You alone, Jesus, can keep us. So shepherd, guide, and protect your people. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.